Hello, everybody. This is James McDaniels, and we have got another great week for you on the NBA and NASCAR Power Half Hour. And um, we've got some quite, we have some very interesting uh, information to uh, tell you guys about today. Um, first off, I'm not as informative of this week's uh, Phoenix race because I was actually at a basketball tournament all day today. So I didn't get to see the race, but I do have the uh, highlights and the big stories of the race. So I uh, will tell you those and uh, see kind of what the outlook of the rest of the season is going to be. And the NBA, oh my gosh, we've got some stories from Miami just going absolutely nuts on their winning streak. 14 wins in a row now for them. Talk a little bit about that. And uh, also, of course, as a Kings fan, I always talk about the Kings somewhat every week, but this week... Uh, Mayor Kevin Johnson in his uh, State of the City address made some huge announcements on um, on making a bid towards buying the Kings and to counter with the Seattle offer that has already gone through and that file for relocation that that Hanson Bomber group in Seattle pushed for in order to get the team bought and moved to Seattle. So we'll talk about that, and uh, that's pretty much the uh, lineup for you guys today. Um, so let's get on with it. The first story I want to talk about with Phoenix was, um, apparently they have removed the roof cameras from, uh, the, the sprint cars during this race. And, um, it actually says that the, um, the cars are actually going to not have the roof cameras in most of their races on, mo on the intermediate tracks. And of course, if you know NASCAR, Intermediate tracks are what um, most of the tracks that the drivers go to. They're the mile and a halves. Um, even some of the short tracks could even be considered um, intermediate tracks. Um, but this is what uh, series director John Darby said um, about the removal of the cameras. He said, it's just one of the several moves that was made during the offseason as the officials worked to, uh, um, for changes to the new Generation 6 cars. Um it says of primary concern was to lessen the impact impact of turbulent air that previously hampered side by side competition at the series intermediate tracks. So this was another thing that they they said. It says what officials found that was that changes made underneath the car seem to stay more consistent, whether you are out front by yourself or seventh in a pack of cars. Darby said. So there's many, uh, th this is kind of a weird thing to see that they're taking these cameras off. And um, just to give you kind of an insight of where they, of where we will still see these roof cameras these, this season, we will still see them at the super, speed, we, super speedways of Daytona and Talladega. We will also see them at the road courses like Sonoma and Watkins Glen. And we will also see them at some of the smaller venues. But most of the intermediate tracks, however, are not going to have those roof cameras that give us a great view of what the drivers basically see in their cars. Now, of course, we have some new camera angles that were that were introduced this season. We have that camera angle, of, uh, that, that camera inside the car, where it basically is like on a pole. And what it does is that when you're, go when you're in going in the banking, especially Daytona and stuff, what that camera does is that it just stays exactly it stays exactly parallel to what a parallel ground would be um so like if you were going to the bankings of daytona you would the camera would not tilt so when they go into high bank corners you'd be the car would be pretty much basically on its side you'd basically be feeling what the driver would be feeling and when you're at daytona oh my gosh you were you are so sideways on that camera. It amazes me just how uh, steep the corners are at Daytona, and of course Talladega is also uh, banked pretty high too. So I like the I like that new camera, and um, also another new camera that the Fox had. Um, I don't know if it's just Fox or if they're going to have it for the entire season, but what it is is it's basically a camera that stretches over the speedway. And and it goes down the entire front stretch, and it's it's tied on a rope, and basically just moves back and forth with the field, and it can move pretty fast to keep up with the with the uh, racers, which I really enjoy. Um, like I said, I don't 
I don't know if bot if it's just Fox or all the other people that are doing these other cameras that they've introduced. Um, but uh, here's actually uh, here's some more information on the uh, camera views because people were kind of getting a little bit worried about those cameras. Like if they take the cameras off the roofs, which has kind of been a specialty of NASCAR for a long time because they've had those roof cameras for a long time. They were kind of scared what happens with the other cameras because you know cameras in NASCAR are pretty important to kind of feel what the drivers are going through. So uh, this is uh, what NASCAR told uh, the press, basically. It says that television partners Fox, TNT, and ESPN will continue to have cameras in various locations inside the car. Among the new pieces for Fox, which opened the season with coverage of the Sprint Unlimited and the Daytona 500, was the Gyrocam, a center-mounted camera that rotates to remain level with the horizon as a car speeds through the turns. Now that's the camera that I was just telling you about that stays exactly in the same position. You can really feel what the drivers are feeling when you're going through those bank corners. Um, and so, so there was a, according to um, the vice president of motorsports production for ESPN, the same company provides the in-car camera systems for ESPN, Fox, and TNT. So uh, it doesn't sound like we're going to be losing a lot of camera angles, which is pretty good. And uh, it's it's just a minor thing, just one less camera angle to really look for. And as the fans, that kind of be a little bit, a little bit disappointing. But I think um, overall, I think it's very important that you know if NASCAR is doing this for the good of the sport, then I guess it's all right. It's just us fans are going to have to take one miniature hit with one less camera angle to be able to uh, view the drivers on. So that's the update on the. Um, on the driver's roof cameras that they will be removed, which started this week at the Phoenix race. And um, they're going to be removed at most of the intermediate tracks. Of course, we will still see them at Daytona, Talladega, Sonoma, Watkins Glen, some of the smaller intermediates. But uh, about two-thirds of the races that NASCAR is going to run this year, for the Sprint Cup anyway, um, they will not have the roof cameras on top of the cars. So that is the update on the camera issue uh, um, that came up earlier this week when NASCAR announced that they were not going to have the roof cameras at um, at the Phoenix race. And uh, speaking of Phoenix, how about the race in total at, at Phoenix this week? Um, Carl Edwards, of course, we all remember him when uh, two years, I think it was two years ago, he and the Tony Stewart tied for the... Uh, Sprint Cup Championship after they had um, changed the point system. And um, they they basically tied. And um, Carl Edwards lost, however, because he had less wins than Tony Stewart. I believe the count was one. Uh, Tony Stewart had five and Carl Edwards had one. Not 100% sure on that, but I think that's what it was. Um, but um, so he finally ended what was a 70 race um, winless streak. And he finally did another backflip. That's, of course, his very famous um, victory victory gesture or victory victory celebration is doing the backflip off of the, uh, not the hood of his car, but the, um, the compartment where he comes out and where that net, where the netting is that separates him from the outside. And he basically opens it up and stands where he lies it down and then does a backflip. Honestly, think that's the best celebration in NASCAR, and um, it's great to see Carl Edwards being up front again. And that's pretty good for me too, because I had Carl Edwards finishing in the top ten in this race because um, I remember what he did last time when they were there at Phoenix. He 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 did very well for a good amount of the day, I believe, and he uh, I think he got wrecked or something, and he and he really got laid in late. But Carl Edwards has always been very good at Phoenix, so. When I'm playing Streak Streak for the Cash on NASCAR.com Fantasy, uh, that's that's pretty good. You can't get any better top ten finish than first, so uh, that's really good. And hopefully my fantasy teams will do well too. But um, let's go to some of the other stories of the day at uh, Phoenix. So of course we all remember Danica Patrick from last week, and uh, she had her historic week at Daytona. She came, became the first woman to ever lead a lap at Daytona. She ever became she became the first woman to ever um, get the po get a pole position, and it turns out it was in the Daytona 500, which is also pretty cool. And um, 
that's pretty much the history she made. She finished actually pretty well. She finished eighth. And um, so, of course, coming into this week, she might have had a lot of confidence. Unfortunately, I don't think that confidence was uh, was well maintained. Either it, either it was there and something happened or something of which. But either which way you look at it, Danica Patrick didn't have a very good week at, or didn't have a very good Sunday at Phoenix. In fact, she slammed to the wall, and I got a picture of her car here. And, uh, oh my gosh, it, it, it looks terrible. Her hood's all the way up, blocking her view. And it looks like uh, looks like all four tires are down. Two of the tires look like they aren't even in the right position. Of course, they could be just turned. That car just looks like wreckage. Uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of um, body damage. So, uh, Danica Patrick didn't have a very good uh, day at Phoenix, as it is obvious that she slammed the wall and crashed. So, that ended her day. And um, it wasn't a very good day for uh, Newman and Clint Boyer. Newman himself had a pretty bad um, day at Phoenix. Um, I'm trying to look up here and see exactly what happened to him. It appears that he wrecked his car into the wall. And yeah, I got a picture of him here. And it is clear that his car nailed the wall pretty good. So that so that's another good driver uh, in um Ryan Newman that didn't have a very good day at Phoenix. I mean, Phoenix itself is a very difficult racetrack. And this is why I say that, is because Phoenix is so different from most of the other courses. Most of the courses are like one and a half, one mile, uh, two miles. Um, they got pretty long straightaways. They're just pretty much all curves. And um, they, it's kind of just two, two straightaways and four turns, and that's it. However, in in, um, in at Phoenix, it's very different because um, they, basically you go down the front straightaway and you go into turn one, and you go into turn one pretty easy. It's uh, you you're gonna have to do some braking, but you come out of turn one, and then this is what makes makes Phoenix different. Phoenix has a very interesting dog leg that's actually kind of banked, and uh, they used to have grass in that area. But now they took the grass out, and now it's just all concrete. And you're allowed to go as low as you can. Now, at, even though they allow you to go as low as you can, not many times does going very low on the dog leg and pretty much just skipping the dog leg all on its own does you well. Honestly, it doesn't really help you no matter where you are. I mean, if you're right next to a guy, then maybe it might help you. But uh, honestly, going through or trying to miss the dog leg really either way doesn't matter but that's the way phoenix is different is because they got this very unique dog leg uh shape on the back of the track and then of course you head into turn uh i don't know turn three turn four if, if that's what their turns are if they consider the only the other two only half turns then um that the the uh the phoenix um last two turns at phoenix are not really banked they are they are actually um banked but they're not extremely banked but they are still banked and that's what uh i think that's what causes a lot of cars to not wreck as much is because when you have banking every little bit of banking helps of course it's not as extreme as those super speedways but uh i i like the fact that phoenix has a little bit of banking because it makes for an interesting um com it makes for an interesting um ride an interesting competition to try to get down low and make things happen like, I remember uh, Denny Hamlin, he did a crazy thing on the last lap. I watched it and um, on uh, on NASCAR.com. And basically what he did was he went all the way down on the dog leg and got back up, and he was right next to Jimmy Johnson. And then he was ahead of Jimmy Johnson going through the last turn. Then Jimmy Johnson got some kind of a run of some kind. And uh, he just beat out Denny Hamlin to uh, get second place, and, Dan and Danny Hamlin finished uh, third. So, Jimmy Johnson, he's had a pretty good two weeks. I mean, first in Daytona 500, and now this week he's second at Phoenix. So, he's had a pretty dang good start, if you can, if you ask me, for uh, this uh, for this NASCAR season. And uh, let's go to one other weird thing that happened at Phoenix today. It happened with Clint Boyer. And um, this is not... And, of course, we all remember last time the uh, NASCAR drivers were here at Phoenix... And, uh, oh my gosh, Jeff Gordon and Clint Boyer got into it. Of course, as we may all remember last season at Martinsville, uh, Boyer was uh, 
the reason everybody blamed him for causing Jeff Gordon to wreck when they had a restart with like a few laps to go. And uh, Clint Boyer and Jeff Gordon also nudged each other a few other times during the season. They had a few run-ins. And so pretty much what happened was that Jeff Gordon and Clint Boyer weren't having the greatest of days. They were just having okay days. But then Jeff Gordon, he he got clipped by some way by Clint Boyer, and he went up in the wall, pretty much ruined Jeff Gordon's day. And at that point in the season, Jeff Gordon had, had enough of all the stupid crap that uh, apparently he felt Clint Boyer was giving him. So then he waited for Clint Boyer to come back around, intentionally wrecked him, ended his championship ended his championship chance chances sorry um by all by all means by wrecking him and then clint boy was really mad he and jeff gordon he, they didn't i don't think they actually got into it but uh both uh they clint boy was pretty mad and he got into a pretty big fight with uh with um both of the crews um i believe jeff gordon jeff gordon got a few penalties for what he did i think he got probation till the end of last year or something he also got fined maybe even dock points i believe but um so anyway, of course, we all remember what happened to Clint Boyer la last time, which was that big old her uh, um, hassle with Jeff Gordon. This year, uh, or this race, um, didn't instead of hitting, trying to hit Jeff Gordon, Clint Boyer actually hit a pit crew member. Yeah, not too often does a NASCAR driver, experienced NASCAR driver, run into their own pit crew member. I don't know how... You do that. I mean, obviously, I haven't seen the video yet, but I just know that he hit him, and uh, and I just, I mean, he obviously there had to have been something that had gone wrong, miscommunication or something that allowed him to go. But um, if you're a if you're a NASCAR driver, I think you should be able to at least not run over your pit crew. It's hard enough just to try to get in your pit stall and and, and whatnot. But running, I've seen a few moments when pit crews have gone run over by the drivers or somebody. Or, or by their own driver or some other driver. I mean, it's not it's not too uncommon, but uh, it definitely is uncommon. I can say that it's not too uncommon, but it's uncommon, and uh, that's uh, because it's pretty. And since it's uncommon, that's why it pretty much got in, into the news basically on NASCAR.com that Clint Boyer hit his pit crew member. So uh, that was another interesting thing. So Clint Boyer, last two Phoenix races have been great. First time. Uh, last time got hit by Jeff Gordon and gotten his whole hassle. This time he hit, uh, this time he hit his own pit crew member. Who knows what he will hit next time at, uh, Phoenix. I cannot wait for that because he always seems to be going, he always seems to be doing something, uh, at Phoenix. So can't wait to see the, um, next, uh, next time at the end of the season when they come over to Phoenix before, and during the chase for the cup. Um, can't wait to see what happens to him. Uh, let's, uh, so basically, summary of Phoenix, uh, Carl Edwards ends his 70 race winless streak, um, Danica Patrick, she wrecks, uh, Ryan Newman, he wrecks, uh, Clint Boyer hits a pit crew member, um, Jeff Gordon finishes ninth. Jimmy Johnson just edges out Denny Hamlin for, uh, for second after a pretty big battle on the very last lap of the race. So that's pretty much the rundown. Oh, and of course, the cameras on the cars. Um, we, we will not see the roof cameras on the cars for most of the races, except at the road courses, the super speedways, and the smaller intermediate tracks. But two-thirds of the season's races, the cars will not run with roof cameras. So that is the news for NASCAR. I'm sorry I couldn't be a little bit more thorough because I did not see... The race because I was in a basketball tournament today uh, about two hours away from here from where I live so I uh, was busy with that all day didn't get back to about an hour or two ago um, but uh, here's here here let's go to let's move on to uh, the NBA and I know a few things that are going on in the NBA right now of course we're getting down to it we we played around what near about 57 58 59 games around that now um, and, uh, so we're pretty close to, we're pretty close to starting to get, um, predictions to what, to where teams are going to end up for the playoffs. So there's about, what, another 25 games left to go in this season. 
And, of course, we talked about NBA All-Star Weekend not too long ago. And, and of course, usually the season for a team can be usually one of two worlds. Usually they'll do very well either before or after the All-Star break. And then they'll be bad the other part, uh, either before or after the All-Star break, whichever one was not their good one. Um, I, I know that because a lot of uh, the Kings are usually rated on that. They usually tend to play better after All-Star Weekend in these last few years. So that's why I know that's that, uh, that stat they kind of keep and rating and stuff. But, uh, if you want to go with the ratings, like top of the ratings, how about Miami, the Miami heat 43 and 14. They have a current winning streak of 14 wins in a row. And now you have LeBron James. He's just been putting up monster numbers every single game. I mean, he, I mean, I understand that, He's not putting up his highest averages that he's ever averaged, but right now he's being so consistent and putting up some good numbers that I think you can argue that this is being that 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 right now this is one of the best times of LeBron of LeBron James. I mean, there's been good times too that he's also had, but I think right now he's just in a stretch right now where he's just unstoppable. And uh I can't wait to see where Miami ends up. I don't I, I don't think there is any question that um, Miami will probably get the uh, Eastern Conference title in terms of in terms of when they go to the playoffs. They will be leading the East when it comes to uh, playoff time. The second ranked team in the Eastern Conference actually is Indiana. If you can believe that, the Indiana Pacers are actually leading the East, and not too often have we seen that as of late. Indiana. I mean, they're beating out. They're beating out New York, Atlanta, Chicago, Brooklyn, Boston. They're beating out some pretty good teams. Indiana is. I mean, they've had they've ha- they do have some pretty good players on that team, and uh, they're they're eight game or no, they're seven games back of the Miami Heat. But I but I honestly don't think Miami with all their big old trio is going to be able to be beat, especially with how LeBron James is playing in that streak that they have now. Now you go over to the West, and again, you know, we never talk about. Oklahoma. We never talk about the uh, the Spurs. We always talk about Oklahoma City, the L.A. Clippers, and the Memphis Grizzlies, Golden State Warriors, Houston, the L.A. Lakers, blah 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 blah. But we never talk about San Antonio. Why the heck do we never talk about San Antonio? I mean, these are the Spurs that we're talking about here. The Spurs have a very good record right now in the NBA. In fact, they have the best record best winning percentage in the nba right at this very moment and we do not talk about them like they like we like we should be they're beating miami and they're beating miami in percentage not by much but they still are they're beating oklahoma city they're beating the clippers they're beating new york they're beating all these teams they they're beating all the other 29 teams in the league and we do not talk about them i mean i understand they're old and stuff with parker and uh Parker and um, I can't think of what his name is uh, right now, but um, but when you've got Parker, an all star like Parker on the team, oh Duncan, Duncan, that was still a guy that I was trying to remember. I know Parker and Duncan are pretty old, but still, San Antonio has been a you. So San Antonio is a force you should not reckon with because they are very good. I mean, they will they will beat you so hard sometimes if you don't play good. Because San Antonio, you just have to pretty much get a pretty old, big old lead and just hope that they don't come back. Because San Antonio's got that way of coming back. I mean, there's no way you get 47 wins and 14 losses and 61 games without being able to come back and uh, being able to hold your lead. So uh, I honestly think people should stop talking about Oklahoma City and the LA Lakers. And instead, they should just talk about the Spurs and Miami. Because right now... The way I see it, the Spurs and Miami, they're going to be two of, they're probably going to be the two teams. I mean, I, that's personally what I want to see. I would love to see Miami and San Antonio go battle it out in the NBA Finals. If that was the way that, if, if I had to have it my way, that would be the way I would have it, would be Miami and San Antonio battling it out. But with, so the battle is basically between Parker and Tony, uh, no, no, Tony Parker, between Parker and Duncan versus Bosch and LeBron James and Dwayne Wade. That's personally what I would want to see. 
But, of course, playoffs are very different than a 82-game regular season. So we will see where uh, where they end up because odds are either either one of them is going to get upset or or uh, they're just going to be beat by another very good team uh, when it comes down to when, when it comes down to it after they've beaten some of the easier teams. So, like Oklahoma City or the LA Clippers could probably knock them out. Um, of course, one person from the West, one person from the East goes and plays for the NBA championship. Only one person can represent the West, and we will see who it's going to be. But of all things, who knows? Right now, if the season ended right at this very moment, the Los Angeles Lakers, and, you, and you're going to hear me right when I say this, they would not, quote me, they would not be in the playoffs right now if, they, if, the, um, if the season ended today. They, they would not be in the NBA playoffs, if you can believe that. Because here's the rankings. They're ranked ninth. The rankings in the West goes as follows. The San Antonio Spurs, the Oklahoma City Thunder, the LA Clippers, the Memphis Grizzlies, the Denver Nuggets, the Golden State Warriors, the Utah Jazz, and finally the Houston Rockets. LA Lakers, ninth. You have to be in the top eight to go and make the playoffs. So right now... As a Kings fan, of course, I'm pretty happy that the Lakers are not in the position. But of course, we've still got a few we've still got a few games left to go for sure, between probably twenty and twenty five games left this season. So there's a there's still a lot that can happen, but as of right now, uh Houston Rockets would be beating the Lakers right now in the playoff race and they would get the uh um eighth and final spot. The Houston Rockets would over the Lakers for the um playoffs. So that's your um, that's your standings update for right now, and I'm gonna I'm gonna end today basically by talking about as you all know I'm a Kings fan, and I say that every week. And um, Mayor Kevin Johnson, I don't know what we could have done without him in all of this time with Anaheim and uh, that deal that we almost had to build a new arena with the Maloofs, and uh, when that fell apart, and now the team got bought from the Maloofs, reloc- relocation was filed. And now, Mayor Kevin Johnson, he, he I remember watching this. I, I stayed up and watched the entire State of the City address when he gave his when he gave the speech uh, a few nights ago. I believe it was Thursday night. And um, basically, he, he uh, announced that Mark Mastrove was going to put and and if, for those who do not know who Mark Mastrove is, he's a he's the 24-hour fitness um, founder, and he actually also tried to buy the um what was it? I believe it was the um oh yeah, it was the Golden State Warriors that he tried to do. But um, he 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 was outbid by Joe Lacob and Peter Guber for the Golden State Warriors, and uh, they sold for four hundred fifty million dollars. So anyway, Mark Master put in an offer to buy the Kings, and that officially got to the NBA on March first. And uh, Ron Burkle, he uh, he's actually leading the the uh, race to try to build an arena, uh, try to you know finance it, build it, whatever you want to say. And um, right now, the rumor location would be at uh, GMA Ventures, and that's at the downtown Plaza Shopping Mall, and that would just create so much economic opportunity where they are right now, and uh, that that would be huge. And and uh, GMA is on with it too. And for those who don't know Ron Burkle, he's a he's a co-owner of the Pittsburgh Penguins. He's a billionaire. Um, and uh, I remember he also saved the Pittsburgh Penguins too. When uh when he um when he co when he co owns this team he he actually did save the Pittsburgh Penguins when they were bound to I don't know it was either they re- were going to relocate or end the team or whatever but he brought them back and now they're one forced to be reckoned with in the NHL but um uh basically sixty five percent of the stake um for the Sacramento Kings was sold to the Chris Hansen Group by the Maloose for three hundred forty one million um not too long ago and. Um, before this, uh, before this equity thing came up with the arena, the first twenty million dollars was lined up by uh, local supporters, and that, and the hope is to buy the seven percent out of bankruptcy that that team is in with that twenty million dollars. One of those investors is actually former Sacramento Kings All Star Mitch Richmond, 
And uh, he was a 2013 Basketball Hall of Fame finalist, so it's great to see Mitch Richmond come out, support his team, and and give in a, a million dollars to help buy the team. Um, and Kevin Johnson made it clear that uh, it's not going to be the Sacramento Kings that are going to be uh, Seattle Seattle's new team. I mean, he did say, you know, uh, Seattle, I hope they do get a team, but all I'm going to say is that, uh, and I'm going to be clear on this, crystal clear, that they are not going to get our team, the Sacramento Kings. So we'll see what will happen. I mean, uh, of course, Hanson Group and stuff, they have already filed for relocation. They've, they've uh, took in their sale of the Kings to the NBA to be um, approved. And, um, of course, Hanson Group and them, they're worth billions and billions and billions of dollars. They got more money than probably Mark Mastrove and Ron Burkle combined. But you got to remember, um, uh, basically what Kevin Johnson said was that when he talked to um, Dave Stern and announced that they were going to put in that application, and uh, because... Basically, what Mayor Kevin Johnson did was that he had a, his own deadline to get everything by March by March 1st. March 1st would be the deadline to send in a proposal that would be equity um, for an arena, that would be support, that would be uh, corporate support and stuff like that, economic proof and stuff like that. So uh, he met, he, he went down the checklist of everything that he promised, and every single check on that checklist was checked off as he went through his speech. And um, but you got to remember that uh, in terms of when the NBA is going to think about this, they got to remember that the team is located in Sacramento, and if the and if the offer as, and if their offer that um, that uh, David Stern said that John that Johnson quoted that David Stern said was very strong or pretty competitive, I should say, then um, you got to you got to realize that the team being in Sacramento, the NBA is going to have to consider that the that since the offer is pretty competitive that the Kings are in Sacramento. So if the deal is competitive and the Kings are already in Sacramento and they've got full proof of everything that they have been asked of, then I think with all little respect, the the most that the, that the least that they could do is to keep the team in uh, Sacramento. Of course, of course, nothing really is going to happen on now until the battle between Seattle versus Sacramento for the Sacramento Kings heads to the NBA Board of Governors meeting. That will be in uh in about what a month and two weeks about six weeks from now um uh, april 18th and 19th we'll be watching every minute of that and uh we will see what will happen will the Kings stay in sacramento or will they move to seattle financially it probably would be a better move to move to seattle but i think with uh the two offers that are being given and um, even though the financial details have not been exposed yet, considering that David Stern did say it was competitive, and the fact that the Kings are, have stayed in Sacramento, or, or they are currently in Sacramento, and the fact that they've pretty much done everything they possibly could every single time the team had to overcome adversity to not move, uh, I think the Kings would, in in that sense, deserve to keep their team and uh, and keep the Kings in Sacramento. But... It's going to be all up to the NBA Board of Governors, April 18th to 19th. Definitely mark your calendars because it's going to be one interesting showdown. Seattle versus Sacramento for the Sacramento Kings. And that is all I got to say. So I'm actually surprised. I actually made this broadcast uh, half an hour or so. Actually over half an hour. We're about 33 and a half minutes in now. So uh, yeah, this has been a... Uh, it's been another great edition of the NBA and NASCAR Power Half Hour. As for the other sports that are going around, um, college basketball March Madness is going to begin. That should be pretty dang awesome. As uh, best colleges and the best players, Division One battle it out to see who is the best college team in basketball. So we're in March, and it's time for March Madness. Cannot wait for that to start. And, of course, um, the, uh, NFL combine, I, it's either over or still going on or something, but, uh, Mante Teo, I think his draft status has really been hurt after his performance, especially in the 40 yard dash. It'd be quite interesting where he's going to get selected, but I think his draft seriously did drop after what he showed at the com combine and especially after what he showed in the 40 yard dash because he was pretty dang slow for, uh, his position. And uh, baseball spring training's going on. We got games, and pretty soon, 
Um, in another month or so, we're going to have the opening day of baseball, and we'll begin America's great game once again. And we will see if the Giants can repeat as World Series champions for for three times in four seasons, or maybe we'll have the Cardinals come and win a championship, or maybe we'll have completely somebody different. So can't wait to see what happens in baseball there. And uh, that's pretty much your sports minute. So without further ado, this has been the NBA and NASCAR Power Half Hour already in our sixth week. I will see you next week where I will have information and updates and review of all the um, action that happens at next week's Sprint Cup race um, in NASCAR. And we'll also have any updates to the NBA um, as they come along. So this has been James McDaniels. And this has been the NBA and NASCAR Power Half Hour. I'm signing off. Good, uh, good night and have a wonderful rest of the week.